Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be what? Amen. Amen. There you go. So the couple of things I want to share is, number one, do you know the difference? Let's hope you do. Between pride and confidence. The other day I was called a proud person by somebody who didn't know it came out of the side of their mouth. And, and I went to God. I said, Lord, I don't want to be prideful because the spirit resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Do you agree with that? It says it a couple of places in the New Testament. And so the, he said to me, tell them this. Confidence is confidence in me, not in them. The confidence you have cast not therefore away your confidence, which has great recompense and reward for you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. So confidence is that steadfast believing in God. A person that's confident doesn't have to second guess themselves. That's me. I come on like a gangbuster because I'm not second guessing. I'm not thinking it's okay. So, so confidence is one thing. Pride on the other was the spirit resist the? Pride. Yeah. So people with pride, they're always talking about me, what I'm doing, I'm, 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 I'm. They're always wanting to be in control. They're always either thinking of themselves and everybody else second, or they're depressed because they're thinking too much about themselves. Come on, smile up at me. Everyone say, give me confidence, God, and help me resist being prideful. be looking at things. So I want us to go to our opening scripture. Remember this month I gave us a scripture sort of to get used to what Jesus is to us. Earlier I said that Jesus is our Sabbath. He's our rest. The word Sabbath means to rest. Can you say amen? So we're going to read this Matthew 11, 28 through 30 again with all of us. You follow me. I'll read it to you. You read along. Are you tired? Worn out? Burn out on religion. Boy, that's a good one. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. How many here experiencing that? That is if you put him first and keep him first and don't get things in the way. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Aren't we supposed to yoke up with Jesus and, and learn from him? Say amen, somebody. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. See, people being led by the Spirit, they flow. They don't jerky, jerky, herky, derky. They just move and they flow. And God's never in a hurry. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Can you say amen? How many here could identify with that? Say, that's mine. So now I want to read this paragraph, and then we'll go to our, our studying scriptures, okay? So as we open up this morning, I want to share with you, God wants us 
to be led by the Spirit and learn what it's like to be soldiers. Now, there's many metaphors in the New Testament. God likens the Holy Spirit unto a dove, okay? Likens the Lord unto a lamb, you know? Likens to be led of the Spirit like wind and air and all of these things. Can you say types and shadows? And so with these types and shadows, they paint wonderful pictures to us. Amen. So we're also soldiers. Whether we know it or not, we're children of God. We're sons and daughters of God. But we're soldiers. Now, folks, this is how I, I want to set you up. You're a soldier not in a fight for your life. You're a soldier in a fight for others' lives. You see... When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I first surrendered. That means I'm no longer in opposition towards God. I surrender and become his child. Can you say amen? Then God begins to teach me and train me by his spirit. I try to leave the things in my past alone because they didn't teach me much. So I begin to seek the word and seek the spirit of God so that I can begin to learn the way God wants me to learn. And then I find out on my journey that I'm also likened unto a soldier. Hello, a fellow laborer in the kingdom of God. Amen. And so we're soldiering, we're fighting in a war for lost souls, not for our own. This is what the enemy did. When you got saved, when you got blessed, you already won, put you already in victory. Say amen. Jesus, he already won the victory. So what the enemy does is he tries to think we're winning victories. No, no. Then you're doing it. You step back and let Jesus win the victories ahead of you. Go and start praying three months in front of you so that every time you get to, in tomorrow, tomorrow's already victorized. But the warring, the armor, the weaponry, why are we giving that, Pastor Kerry? Because we're after pushing the devil off of our family, off of our children, off of our lives, our businesses. Can you say amen? Our job is to occupy in this life, to push the enemy out so we can have a good and peaceable and beautiful life. Amen. Say amen. amen. Some of you already have that. That is, we don't mess it up. Here's a word for you, Seth. It's such, so tempting to criticize things, you know, when we don't think about it. And the Lord says, he's got such a great walk ahead of you in the days to come. Be careful what you criticize. Or just take it like that. All right. So, that is, realize, if God's got a word for you, it's always good. It might be pinpointy. It might convict but it's always good because if we do it and act, it'll bring peaceable fruits of righteousness and we'll grow thereby. We've been exercised thereby. Can you say amen? So as we continue, so I want, you, I want to read the rest of this to you. It says, so our life must, as we grow in the Lord, we must learn how to fight the right way. Now, you've heard me say this a lot. In the last four years, I've been teaching this. But I'm going to even say it more and more. Christians don't know how to fight. They really need to know how to rest. They don't know how to fight, and they don't know how to rest. And so, first of all, the battle has been won. So if the battle has been won, you don't fight to hope to get. You fight, get your hands off of my property. That's how you fight. Satan, this is my planet. Satan, this is my family. Satan, and I turn them all over to God. Now you've done the right thing. Now God stands up and say, do you have something you accuse them of, you little turkey? And God stands up and he says, they are all under my care. We need to see pictures of this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not... He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's probably why he gave you here, a green pastor. And, and leads me beside still waters. So you can drink, and yeah, amen, and yet you stay away because you're mad at somebody. Here we are in God's sheepfold. We're in the church of God. 
If you can imagine a horseshoe, a horseshoe can either upside down or up, right side up. It has an opening, doesn't it? Okay, but all the rest of it is in comforts round about. So a sheepfold is just like that. It's like a fencing. It goes all the way around where all the sheep hang out there through the night. And they're protected and cared for. And the, the door is open. And guess where the shepherd sleeps? He sleeps right out the door. Guess where Jesus is? He's right at your door protecting you because you're in the sheepfold. Can you say amen? It's only the little goat followers. Mm, the goat followers. That sounds really, that doesn't sound too good. Right, Colin? Didn't sound too good. Anyway, goats, they can't sit. They can't love. They can't do, they're, they're too into what they're doing. Have you ever watched a goat? They're busy, 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 busy. They won't stay in the pen. They're walking around doing their own thing. Hello? So Jesus likens the time that you and I are living is separating the sheep from the... Now, do you clearly understand? A goat is anybody that won't follow God. Hello? Won't follow the shepherd. They're like sheep gone astray. They need to return to the shepherd and the bishop of their souls and learn to follow him like Elijah followed Elijah and get the double-fold blessing. You want to know why I'm so blessed? Because I hang out with God. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. I got Jesus in my chest. That doesn't really, and it doesn't matter about the rest. I got Jesus in my chest. I changed the word Jesus. You know, I got blessings in my chest. Anyway, I thought when I was singing that song the other day, Christy, I saw you and Scott doing something like that as a play. It's by Cain, and it's just a simple song about being blessed, get your eyes off the rest. I mean, a wonderful little song. Right now, we can't play it up there because they hewed a copyright on us. We got to wait till it gets a little older. But it'll be a good one for, for you and Scott, too, because you guys got the voices for it. And, you know, I can see you walking up here. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. I've got Jesus in my chest. You know, can you imagine? Anyway, I could care less about the rest. I've been married. Yes, I'm blessed. You see, you, you see what I mean? Our, our job is not to be distracted onto the serious things that only Jesus can deal with. Your mom, your children, only Jesus can deal with those things. But the devil's got you chasing around and being afraid and not wanting, you know, this kind of thing. Don't let him do that to you. You know I'm talking to you. I, I spend every day praying for you. So I know exactly what the devil's trying on you. I know exactly where you're at, where you should be, and where you're not. Ooh, I pass your care. It sounds really, really like you're nosing yourself into everybody's business. No, I'm praying for you, and God's showing me so I can pray for you. You want a pastor like that? You ever read in about the gifts of the Spirit? It says that, that we be ministered to, and even if our, we are convicted of our sin, we'll be blessed by that because it's been revealed, and now we can get it fixed. Instead of getting all upset, ooh, self, me, 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 self, 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 me, 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 self, self. You can't hurt my feelings because I'm not alive to get hurt. What do you, how come you're not alive? I see you're, you're moving on the stage. You seem pretty alive to me. No, I went to God and asked him to crucify me today. So the life you see is Christ in me. Hello, the life I see in you is the same. Could you say amen? All right. Are you ready to get in this? All right. Our father, original plan was for us to be with him in love. Can you say amen? Don't stay away. All right. We cover four things. Number one, what it takes to be a good soldier, a good soldier. Number two, separated from corruption. Separated. How to be separated from corruption. Number three, use, find the use, I got this all messed up. 
Use the ultimate weapon, Jesus. Folks, when we fight, you don't rail on the devil. You don't accuse the devil. You don't, you don't judge anyone. You don't do any of that because that's not how you fight. You see, in Acts chapter 3, I'm getting ahead of myself, Peter and John were up to the gate beautiful where they prayed all the time, and there was a man crippled at his mother's womb, laid there daily at the, at the gate. And so Peter and John walked up to him and said, and the guy says, Alms, can you give me something? I want an eggnog. <laughs> I'll throw that out for fun. I need some double eggs. You know, anyway, he expected to receive something. So what did Peter say? Silver and gold we don't have. But what we do have, Jesus, I'm going to give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So folks, when we as soldiers, we need to realize that we're giving out Jesus and we fight with Jesus. We don't fight in our own natural strength. Say amen. And then fourthly, resisting, or excuse me, resting, rejoicing in his victory. Resting and rejoicing in his victory. Now, there's a whole bunch of preachers, bless their heart, they just don't know any better. And I'm not, again, I'm not, this is not a picking up, but they're preaching that one day you're going to get your victory. You already got it. You see the deception in that? Because they don't know any better. So whatever they know, they're going to preach. I'm not putting them down. They just don't know. We had a wonderful lady preaching, but everything she preached was evangelistic. You got to come and get your victory. Well, listen, the only way you and I lose the victory is when we don't listen to God. Say amen. Come on. Whose child do you belong to? Amen. Who's your father? Right. Who guides your steps? Amen. And if anything's going wrong, is he doing it? So you must have done something. Go back, go over a review, find out what it is, make some adjustments, and keep going. That's how we shine. That's how we become who we are supposed to be, soldiers of the cross. All right, let's go to our first point. What it takes to be a good soldier, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I Bless you, I sure love you all. My family and friends coming in on, on video, bless you. Presence of God's right there in your home, real strong. In the shop, real strong. All right. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You therefore, my son, this is Paul talking to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses. See, this is the problem. You want church to grow? Stop focusing on what's wrong with your church and start telling everybody the miracles that happened. Did you realize what happened last Sunday? God's presence walked through and used a, a good sister, our sister, and the presence of God filled this place and people smelt Jesus. Have you told your family? Have you went out and told your neighbors? This is how the church gets filled. When you testify and you tell everybody what God is doing. And that's why we're not growing. You're not getting beyond yourself and telling people, come to church, there's miracles there. Bring the sick, bring the lame, bring those that are blind or deaf. Jesus dwells here, folks. Don't treat us like a religious church down the street who never get anything healed. I want to preach myself happy. And look what it says. Among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men and women that will be able to teach others. Talk about it. Share it. You were touched, then go tell everybody you were. See, this is not the time of Jesus. Jesus says, don't tell anybody. He would tell everybody because he didn't want them to make him a God before his time. But in the New Testament, go tell everybody what Jesus is doing in your life. Just don't make up anything. I mean, I went, to, I went to a place where God told me to go after a full gospel businessman fellowship. It was called Lee's Hotel and Bar in Enumclaw. I says, God, you don't want me to go in there. He says, yeah, I want you to stop right here, and I want you to park your car, and I want you to go in there to some people that need to be saved. Now, listen, 
God is not going to tell you if you're an ex-alcoholic to go into a bar. He's just not going to do things like that because he's not stupid. But he told me to because I'm not an alcoholic. I had plenty of chances to be, but I didn't. I refused it. So I went in there, ordered a Coke, sat down, and God saved the alcoholic guy that was sitting next to me, took him to the bathroom, and slammed him to the floor, shook him up so bad he came out completely white as a ghost. When he came out, the bartender got his, what happened to you? He said, I got Jesus in my heart. You've heard the song, I found Jesus in the parking lot? How many heard that one? He found Jesus in the John. You can laugh with me. He did. God cleaned him out, got him saved. And as soon as I was done, God says, okay, it's time to go. I got up and left, and as I was leaving, here comes a crowd of people in. He held off the crowd, held off everything, just so the seeds could be sowed. That's who you are. You're a soldier of the cross. You're a bringer of good news. Where are those prayer meetings? Let's get them going. Can you say amen? We're soldiers. You're good people. You got great things. Keep sowing. As you sow, so shall you. As you sow, so shall you. As you sow, so shall you. If you hold back, you're going to be held back. If you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you, Jesus said. Well, I don't want to say Jesus in front of my mama. She might get mad at me. Let her get mad. You're not doing it to make her mad. You're doing it for, to save her soul. Stop going on things you see and hear. Go on what God tells you. That's the difference. Be led of the Spirit. Your eyes will fool you. Your ears will fool you. Your own head will talk you out of things. Don't let it happen. And going on further, it says, no one engaged in the warfare entangles, listen to this, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. What does that mean, Pastor Kerry? Politics, getting involved in things you can't change. You pray about them and you ask God to deal with them. But as a soldier, you're not to get in, in the affairs of the world, caught up in what the world's doing. Hello? Because <coughs> it's designed by the enemy. Everyone say, I'm on furlough, resting and warring in Christ. I fight for the souls of others because my life is saved. Yeah, Jesus saved you. So you're not fighting for your victory. That's a deception. Well, how come I don't have it? Because you're out fooling around. Stop that. First thing you do, just get up, present yourself to God. Let me say this. I had a guy, he just got in my face, started screaming at me. He says, you teachers of grace. You teach grace, 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 grace. You know, and some of these people will just go out and walk all over God's grace and go out and sin and do whatever they want in spite of God's grace. See, it's just not grace, grace. There's the judgments and there's God and there's... And, you know, I looked at him and waited till he was done. That was a long time. And I says, are you done now? He says, yeah. I says, have you not read that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. If I face, like for example, if you, if, if you came into church and the first thing I said to you was, where have you been? Is that going to make you feel relaxed and open up? No! God never does that. He knows where you've been sleeping. He knows if you've been good. He knows if you're a turkey or you're doing what you should. Hey! Can you say amen? I like to make up little songs like that. That's what you're doing. You just do what God asks you to do. Well, I want, look, at, here's my, my temptation. I'm a people person. I love to be liked, noticed. I want to be appreciated. How many here fit that bill? All of us, I think. And when somebody doesn't, sometimes we get ourselves, our feelings hurt. But thank God we, we know better. Can you say amen? But you're a soldier. Soldiers don't get in, entangled in the politics and the things so much that they are ineffective in their soldiering. Our job is to get up, get our mission for the day, go into the day, capture what we need to capture, come on back, report to God, release it to God, and get ready for the next day. Meanwhile, have fun, play. 
Have fun and play. But when you do an assignment from God, you're a soldier. You've got a special anointing on you for that specific job. Go out, get her done, and then the rest of the time, enjoy God's presence for your obedience. Play a little. Have fun, whippy. Boy, that just ticks the devil off that you can have fun in the midst of him being so intense. All Satan wants us to be is so intense, so uptight, so irritated. Nothing makes us happy. You know, what? one of the things that they used to say about me a long time ago, says, nothing makes you happy, Pastor Kerry. You just don't seem happy. I'm looking at him going, I've only known him two days. Maybe I'm not smiling enough. You know, sometimes people want you to be a certain way so they can justify being who they are. Are you listening to me? Don't be anything other than what God wants you to be and just enjoy yourself. All right, let's go to point two. Everyone say point two. So we know what it takes to be a good soldier. Don't get entangled in the affairs of this world. World's passing away, folks. And all the lusts and all the things. Guess what? Election time's coming. Election time will go. Don't get caught up in it so much that your emotions are all spread all over the place, but rather be focused. You know why we believe in this theme? I'm going to quote it for you. Slow down and focus. Everyone say that with me. Slow down and focus. God is not in a hurry. So if you feel like... God trying to get you, and you're going this, and you have to, and you got to get everything to where your heart's racing and everything. Slow down. That's not God. It could be the project of God, but the way you're entering, and it's not. Slow down and focus. Folks, what happens when we focus on something? We can see it clearly now, right? Many Christians today are not focused. They're just looking at the general what's playing out every day. And they're trying to negotiate like traffic in between all the stuff. No, when you walk and get up and you start into your day, things will move out of your way because Jesus is taking the lead in your life. Instead of you trying to manipulate your way in life and trying to get your ways and things like that, which is witchcraft, a type of witchcraft, manipulation, so you do it. You just go in the authority of Jesus. Now, if you listen to how I preach, and I've, I've been accused of this, and thank God I'm guilty. I preach with one having authority. I don't preach, well, I think it's this way, Peggy. What do you think? What would you do if I taught like that? Hey, folks, I think it reads this. What do you think? Let's have a discussion. Wouldn't that be chaotic, Linda? That would be chaotic, wouldn't it? Because everybody has a different opinion and everything. No, when I preach, I know what it says and I know what it means. Not everything. I'm not trying to brag. This is confidence talking to you. To give you what you need for the day so that you're blessed. I went to God and says, God, what do you want your congregation to do here today? He says, I want you to tell them they're a soldier, but they fight in an unusual way. They put me on their things. Put Jesus like a stamp on your letter. There is a sickness. Talk to your body. Say, body, you be healed. Jesus Christ commands you to be healed. You talk to your body. You talk to yourself. And you speak the word. The word is Jesus. Speak the word. The word says, by his stripes I'm healed. And then all of a sudden you start to get a little shiver. And you go, no, nope, by his stripes I'm healed. Speak the word. Didn't you speak the word and get saved? Huh? Works, doesn't it? So speak it on everything. You're a soldier. You have weaponry that all belongs to God. If it belongs to God, sit God on your situations while you rest and rejoice. You see, I can go to bed at night and actually rest. Because Jesus is up fighting my battles for me. Because I asked him to. Hello? Come on. Jesus, we love you, Carrie. <laughs> you still love me, all right? I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you. 
so that your life takes on something good. I want you to teach others. I don't want you to be sitting there getting all this good stuff yourself. I want you to turn right around and teach your family, teach your, your sons and your daughters. You're going to have to tell your, your, some of your sons and some of your daughters, you need to straighten up your life. Frankly, you're just going to go to hell if you don't straighten up. You know, oh, I could never say that. See, you're holding back Jesus. Most, one of the most greatest themes Jesus taught is how to avoid hell. Hello, read it. How to stay away from there. It wasn't designed for a human being. It was designed for the Satan and his fallen angels. So we don't want to go there. Can you say amen? Never, God never intended what did he say? Fear not the one who can, can destroy your body. Didn't he say this? But fear the one and cast your soul into hell. Remember reading that one? Wave your hand at me if you remember reading that. The one that casts the soul into hell, is it the devil? No. Satan can't cast you into hell. He didn't have the power. He was stripped. Got to get our doctrine right. Okay? And God doesn't cast anybody in hell. Not his children. Not his potential children. How do we get, who's the person that casts us in the hill? We do. By not putting our hands in the hand of the man who stilled the water. We're not turning our life on a daily basis to the one who controls all things and make them work good and perfect. Can you say amen? Now, those of you that are born again, you're sealed. You're okay. But your walk will only be as smooth as rough as you get close to God. We'll only be as smooth and rough as we get as close to God as we need to. Many Christians today are out in the bleachers. I call them spectators. They're watching everything. And their life is hell. I watch people again who love God and they go to church and they pour their whole heart out into doing things and doing, what, and, you know, just doing all that great. But their life and their own personal study, their own being with God face to face is not right. And so all the praising, all the jumping around, all the stuff doesn't become the strength of their foundation. It simply becomes a religious action. And that won't sustain us. It's your personal time with God every morning that changes you and makes you unmovable. Say amen. Have I got to point two yet? All right, point two. Separated from corruption. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. Now this is talking to Christians. The church at Corinth were a bunch of hippies. You see, the church at Colossae were a bunch of intellectuals. The church at Corinthians, if it feels good, do it type of people. And one of the phrases was, if you're going to have a good time, go down to Corinthia, or down, down to Corinth, and have a couple of prostitutes in the weekend. I mean, so it was known as Corinthizing, really bad stuff. You know, it's like going down to San Francisco. And uh, so anyway, but the people, when they got saved, they came in the groups, hordes of people, because it was new. It was exciting. It was like getting stoned again. And so these hippie types would run, but they would have all these bad habits they bring into the church. When they had communion, they'd all bring their own sandwiches and, and they'd eat their own sandwiches and refuse the communion of God. They would do all kinds of crazy things because they didn't know. They'd have more than one wife. I mean, I don't know about you. One's enough for me. Can you say amen? Come on, laugh with me a little bit. That's why Paul writes to Timothy, be the husband of about one wife. Because at that time, you could have three or four of them, and you just didn't tell anybody. So you need to know history, and that's the problem with the church. They don't know. So God is not saying if you've ever been divorced, you can never serve in the Lord. That's not so, because Paul would then have to be rejected. Paul was the chiefest of Pharisees. He had been married at one time, and when he became a Christian, his wife left him, and his family divorced him, and they made a funeral for him. So, he was all by himself. 
So when he says, hey, some people are meant to get married, some people are not meant to get married. He says, if you have been divorced from a wife, don't feel bad. If God's really leading you and you're not just going out seeking somebody, if God's really leading you, you have not sinned if God finds you a wife. Hello. See, I'm not hung up in all of that stupid stuff a lot of people are. Because grace is the greatest thing you can be. God's graceful to us. He knows my life. I didn't have a good marriage. I wish I did. I believe I was married for life, but it didn't arrange that way. But instead of me just being destroyed and doing, keep feeding the destruction, God fixed my life. He said, come to me. I'll I'll restore your life. I'll fix you. I'll, I'll fix what's been damaged and broken. But what are we not doing? All right, let's go on. So it goes, uh, do not be unequally yoked together for unbelievers. Some people say that's for marriage. This is saying don't even hang around the world. It's just talking unbelievers, period. Okay? Uh, excuse me, I got the hiccups. Psalms 1. You stand not in the seat of the, the council of the ungodly. That means standing around the water cooler talking all nasty jokes. Your job is not to hang around the world. Your job is to save it. Hello? Moving right along past that. (laughs) Amen. So look what it says. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what a concord or agreement has Christ with Beal? Beal, that's Satan's name, one of Satan's name. It's the God of the flies. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God. Talk about your body. As God has says, I will dwell in them. Hallelujah. And I will walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Someone say, thank God I'm a child of God. But look, the instructions for us. Look at the next instructions. You can't learn from God while you're hanging out with the world. He just can't do it. Too much confusion there. Therefore, he says in verse 17, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Uh Uh-oh. And I will be a father to you, and you will be to me sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. What is an unclean thing? Folks, now let me explain. An unclean thing is something you know is wrong, but you're going to goof around with it anyway. For some people, it's alcohol. It's unclean. Did you know with alcohol, alcohols, and again, I'm not picking on people, but listen, with alcohol, there's a spirit that comes with drinking. That's why they call it spirits. Do I mean, come on, we're so, so ignorant. So when you drink alcohol, it's designed to be a pharmakia, or an alteration to the way in which you reason. So if you drink enough alcohol, you become stupefied. No longer yourself. Now, I'm, again, I'm not putting anything down. So you're actually casting a spell on you and bringing a spirit on you. So you don't want to deal with that. Now, let me show you something different. Don't get mad at me. This is just what God told me. Marijuana, on the other hand, is an herb. There's no spirit that comes with it. It was one of the things God said is there for your health and you're for your healing. So I'm not condoning people go out and smoke it. But if you do, God is never going to condemn you for it. He might tell you, how's the condition of your lungs? And, you know, talk about your health. But, but somebody goes out, has a problem, and they go do it. There's no spirit that is involved there because you're not altering your sense of personality. It doesn't do that. It just numbs you, makes you happy. Now, I'm trying to tell you, but people have been smoking it for years and years and years, and they got the stupid people who are not saved having a war on drugs, and they're telling you stupid things like, that's going to make you an addict. Well, listen, why do we legalize alcohol, which has killed so many people, 
and we didn't. At the same time, alcohol and pot were up for being accepted or rejected during the uh, prohibition times. They said yes to alcohol because it brought in more money and no to hemp. They called it hemp back then, even though it had much greater purposes and uses besides smoking it, ropes and rugs and clothing. They rejected it because they could not control the alcohol and the demonic forces. Going back, way back, who did Adam give this planet to? Who made alcohol? It's a combination of rotting things, fermenting things, sifting it down, and man's got his whole entire thing is to make people get buzzed. Now, I'm going to take a small journey. Hold on. Back in the days when the fallen angels came down, these fallen angels weren't supposed to have fallen, but they did fall. And they taught the human race what to do with God, wanted them to use the good things. They taught them how to use the bad things. They taught them how to make alcohol, how to take drugs. We're not talking about herbs. We're talking about hardcore snort manufacturing drugs, fentanyl uh, and speed and all these things. He, they, these fallen creatures taught the human race how to make weapons and how to make war and how to make makeup and all these things. Read about it. Read about it. And instead of teaching us how to love and get along with one another and accept Jesus Christ. So going back to the addictive part. Very, it's not what goes in a man that defiles a man. It's what comes out of us. Do you understand what comes out of us? You're talking bad about people and holding unforgiveness. And if you do get a buzz, you're going to say something you wish you didn't. And that's the stuff that comes out of us that we have to give an account of. If you want to have yourself or whatever, just don't affect anybody in any negative way and certainly don't promote it. So I have not promoted smoking, the other thing, and I'm not promoting drinking, but people do it. So rather than condemn them, offer them Jesus. Can you say amen? Was that all right? Did I handle that okay? I hope I handle that gracefully. I'm not, okay? Just so you know, you know, if you got somebody who so says, I can't come to church because I smoke pot. Well, come to church. So you can sit and hear the word to bring you out of things. You're never going to hear the word a bunch around a bunch of potheads. Have you ever been a bunch around a bunch of potheads? Oh, wow, man. Really dig the dingle balls. I'm hippie drug addict rock and roll drummer. So everything I did was around that. You know what? It's stupid. Dopes for dopes. All right, so moving past this. So an unclean thing is what you think is unclean. So if, if you think doing such and such is not a good thing for you, then don't do it. It's called a conviction. I had a pastor say to me, I don't go to the beach because there's so many beautiful women there and I just lose who I am. I thought, don't go to the beach. <laughs> well, you haven't got it together. You have to die to yourself. You know, you, listen, your biggest problem is this flesh. Die to it daily so it doesn't rise up and choke you to death. All right, moving right on. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you. That's the part I like. I want to be fathered. I had a wonderful father. Maybe some of you did, maybe some of you didn't. But our heavenly father is perfect and good. Let him father you. Let him father you. Go to him. Talk up to him about everything. Let him father and love you. And, and do, do yourself a favor. When you go to God, don't talk so much. Listen more. For a while anyway, okay? So he can settle in and begin to show you things you need to know. He loves you. He wants to father you. All right, let's go to point three. We fight using the ultimate weapon, Jesus Christ. Say amen. Second Corinthians chapter 10, listen to this. Verse three and four says, for though we walk in the flesh, the natural man, we do not war according to the flesh, the natural man. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, physical, natural, 
but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. We told you a couple weeks ago, two strongholds, one's in the earth, the one's in your mind. You cast down the ones in your mind that tell you so-and-so doesn't love you. The pastor carries mad at you. He pointed you out today. You notice that person, those words that I said, it's all about you. Me, me. You did this to me. You did this to me. Listen, society, listen carefully, has made a whole bunch of welfare mentality people who thinks the world owes them a living. I mean, I give good gifts to people, but I very seldom hear, thank you very much. God gave you his best gift. Do you tell them every day, thank you very much? And in Ephesians chapter 6, look at this. If we weren't soldiers, why do we have armor? So he says, finally, brethren, in that phrase in Ephesians, that means I've told you about all these doctrines, these positional truths of who you are in Christ. Now, finally, see, that's where that finally is. Now, finally, let's get it. My brethren, be strong in the Lord. Where? In the Lord. You're not strong by yourself. So don't be in the natural all the time. Be in the spiritual, and you can't. It's not wooey, gooey. It's just practical flow. Can you say amen? You know you're headed, and you know that you're going to do something for God when you get there. All right? And it says, put on the whole armor of God. We know how to put on the armor. Everyone say, I know how to put on the armor. Everyone say it with me. Father, in Jesus' name. And the armor's on. God just puts it right on you. Okay? So he does it in a split, multi-split second. Ba-boom! Father, Jesus, name, boom! You're under attack. You feel like the enemy is, maybe something happened and everything's chaotic. You go, Father, in Jesus' name. Boom! Prince of Peace steps right on in and takes control. You have to learn to call on the name of the Lord. Well, I don't want to bother me. He's pretty busy. Right. Okay. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. See, his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Why? Because you're not standing up by yourself. You're not out there in the front threatening the enemy. You're standing up in Jesus Everyone say, I stand up in Jesus. I don't get ahead of him. I stay behind him. So when you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you stand up in Christ and you're silhouetted. And Satan sees Jesus. He doesn't see you. You're in the office of Christ. You need to get a mental picture of this. It's not until we stick our hand out or our lips out, or make some statement that he goes, oh, and then the armor comes right off, and we appear. Now, remember, the armor doesn't fall off. It dims. Folks, if we have bright light in here and we had no light outside, and if I dim the light real slowly, it get darker and darker, it will come in, right? Even though there's light outside. Now you got the point I'm making. You start doing your own thing and your armor will dim. You will no longer be a threat. You'll be a prize to the devil. People that brag a lot, I, I tell them, don't brag. When you testify, always put, God did this. God did this. God is doing this in me. God's taking care. Don't, don't say, I did this for God. I did that. Don't do that. Because Satan always loves to ruin testimonies. And will ruin your testimony when you get up and say, I did this, and I got this, and I got that, and there's no God in there. Not a good thing to do. Say amen. I think you got that point. Let's move on. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So don't get mad at any human being. If some human being does something, calls your name, really gets in your face, who's behind that? 
So why do we get mad at what we see instead of what we can't see? Which really is the problem. Say, oh yes, that's the truth. I have people that hate me, but it's the spirit behind them. I really hate to be in their church with them being there. Because they're not there for God. They're there for confusion. I've seen them come in. Remind me to tell you about the witch that came in when I was first in the ministry and her little chalice. You know, witches have chalices. They're other human beings. They fill with spooks so they can fling them out on the congregation. Remind me to tell you about it. Maybe after our potato bar, we'll go into some detail about some of those. Ask me private things, how God did, how God led me. Let me be able to give you the things that you need. Don't just wait for a Sunday service. Okay? All right. Here's to you. Talk to me. Ask me. How does this work, Pastor Kerry? How do we do this? How do, how do we do that? That's what I did with my pastor. You could call me Elisha and my pastor Elijah. I was there every day until they kicked us out of his house. I got to go to bed. 10 o'clock, everybody. Go home. What's wrong with the church? You can't hardly get them to the church. You've lost it. Everyone say, not me. I'm part of the good group. All right. Now you sheep. Okay. So stay away from corruption. We fight using the way of Jesus. So notice it says, stand and having done all to stand what? Notice it didn't say rail, curse, rebuke. Slash about. Notice it didn't say any of that. It says stand, right? Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Why? Because you're covered in armor. You're covered in armor. So when you stand, doesn't matter what the devil says or accuses you. If you don't act on it, he can't get to you. But because we think of ourselves a lot, we often act on the insults of others, which is really stupid. If I called you a boo-boo, would you get offended? You know, I'm making up some cutesy little thing. But if you were really called a name, would it offend you? I had a guy say, you know, I hate you, Carrie. I hate everything they do with you. And I looked at him, and I smiled at him, and I said, I know that. He wanted to get my goat. He wanted to get at me. Don't let people get your goat. Tell him you already released it. It's out there, you know, doing its own thing. Where did that term, get your goat, come from? Your flesh is like a goat, never wants to obey. Moving right along. I like phrases and understand where they come from. All right, so the weapons of our warfare warfare are what? Mighty in God. So we have to be in Christ. We have to operate in the spirit for these weapons to work. There's no limitation. God is a smart bomb. I say, Father, in Jesus' name, I want you to go into behalf of Piggy's life, in behalf of of, uh, Sherry's life, in behalf of of Linda's life, and I want you to go in, begin to minister to her, give her exactly what she needs to be thinking about today. Go right on in, comfort her, strengthen her, help her to rise up, give her witty ideas and adventures. You see, what I'm doing is giving God invitation, not quite telling him what to do, but giving him lots of room to do things. Now, in Linda or Sherry or anybody's life, Peggy's life, there might be areas in our life that we don't know what to ask for. We might not know our, we are blinded. We're blinded to certain areas that we need to change in. So we want to ask God to go in and do his thing, make the adjustments that we need. So in your time with God, say, God, make some alterations in my heart and in my mind. Help me, Lord, to become a better husband, a better wife, all of these things. And while you're praying, Lord, after all, doctor's appointments are not very long. We use Jesus Christ as the very weapon to pulverize the enemy. Why? Because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus kicked his booty. He rendered him ineffective. And every time we speak the name of Jesus or we speak the word, he gets the same boot right in his face. 
He wants you to forget about being a Jesus freak. Forget about following the Lord. Just be religious. Just kind of show up once in a while. Sure. How do you boil a frog without jumping out? You turn it on real slow and bring it up slowly. Satan will work on you and work on you and work on you. How do you know he's working on you? Because we don't see you as often as you should be here. We see you backing off, making excuses. Hey, frog, you're getting about ready to get boiled, ribbit. Don't let the enemy set you up like that. Hey, Amen. You're too smart, too wise, because you dwell with God. And my last point. I sure went long, didn't I? Did I go long? I'm doing okay. What's wrong with me? My last point to give you. We need a furlough, resting, and rejoicing in his victory. When Jesus was on the cross, one of the seven things he said was, Father, into thy hands I commend thy spirit. He gave back the, the life-giving spirit to God so he could die. And he, and he said, Father, it is finished. It is finished. No more work needs to be done for our salvation. No more work needs to be done for our complete freedom. It's all been done and finished. Now, the key is you and I need to hobnob and walk with Jesus. So he can bring us before the Father, and we can learn about our weaponry as soldiers. We can learn about our behavior as soldiers. We can learn how to use our words properly to guide and to steer our life. Did you know your tongue is literally like the steering wheel of your car? Don't let your tongue go, because it will send you to the ditch. Your tongue has to be controlled, because your tongue is the rudder for your life. That's just killing me. I'm dying if I do. Oh, I've been laughing till I almost died. Can you hear about that? I, I did all, nullify all that, Lord. Forgive me. Why do people use death to describe life? We've been polluted and corrupted. This society is not to be trusted. It's polluted and corrupted. Enjoy the people. Love them to Jesus. We do not put your camp down here. We are going to the other side. Can you say amen? So don't camp here. Don't plan on sticking around here. Plan on getting people saved here. Plan on getting out of here. Plan on going and taking as many people with you as you can. Amen. You guys, you ladies should be having your purses filled with tracks. Things that tell people about God. So therefore, you could be in a restaurant. Set a track out when you leave with a tip. When you go to the bathroom, put one on the back of the toilet. Start sharing your faith. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because you'll get stale if you don't. Folks, even a wonderful glass of water, if it sits long enough, it's going to get stale. Look up at me and say, I'm not stale. You're blessed. You keep the water moving when you meet with God on a daily basis. You talk with them throughout the day. The water keeps moving. It doesn't sit. If we sit too long, think about ourselves. You can see your countenance following. It just falls down and a gray thing comes over your face. It does? Yeah, I have discerning of spirits. I see where you're at, where you're not. You want your pastor to be that way. That doesn't mean I come up to you and go, you haven't been praying. No, I'm not going to do that. But after you listen to one of my sermons, you'll, today, you know what you haven't been doing and you know what you should be doing. That's what sermons are about. Can you say amen? But I don't bring any condemnation. You're God's children. And you know what's neat? When a pastor understands that the people he ministered to are God's children... He will tread lightly and want to give you his best. Would you say amen to that? And that's, you are God's children. So, so everything that we do here, Linda and I do here, all the work, all the little goodies and things that we try to put together, you think that's for me? No. 
You think I want to build a big name for my... I already have a big name. People know me all over. You just mentioned my name. They know Carrie. They just didn't know what happened to Carrie. He just disappeared. Well, I tell you what. The enemy was able to get into my life and really work a havoc on me until God taught me, retaught me the gospel, how to learn the right ways and how to subject, subjecticate my, or to subject myself to God. I was going to use a fancy word for forget. I'm not good at them. All right, let's finish with you. Let's learn how to take a furlough because I know a lot of people. How many of you have ever heard the term intercession? Some people are called to intercede. Pray, 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 and then pray some more. They have a calling on their life to really intercede. Pauline is one of those. Several of you are others. I know she is because God woke me up and told me to give her all the stuff that she needs to be who God wants her to be. And any, any of you too. But an intercessor, if all they do is fight the devil all the time, aren't they going to become battle weary? Yes. And if all you do is rebuking the devil and trying to get a life and trying to have peace in your family, you're doing it all wrong. Don't you need a little rest in your life? Yeah. Let's learn to do things according to God, according to the scripture, according to the spirit of God, so that it's very little effort on our behalf and God does the fighting for us. Say amen. So even at wartime, God will demand you withdraw to him to get rest. Soldiers go home for a furlough to rest before they go back into the war. God's got times where he takes us out of the, the fight and he ministers to our heart and gives us a furlough or a rest. Folks, that could be every day of your life if you realize that Jesus, that you put Jesus out, he fights, you rest. You put Jesus' word out, he fights, you rest. When his word is fighting, when the spirit of God is fighting for you, you do what? Rest. Well, how do I do that? I'm so wound up about it. See, you put your soul into it, and God only requires you to release the spirit of things. Emotion's good. But we can get caught up in things we shouldn't. Hello? And I'll pause for a minute. Okay, let's get into this. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the day of Moses in rebellion, when they were all overthrown in the wilderness. And then it goes to verse 9. Where your hearts as, a, as in the rebellion in the day of the wilderness. Where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Now how many know that the, from Egypt to the promised land was how many days? 11 days. How come it took them 40 years? Very simple answer. Because it was they were doing it. So when they didn't like it, guess who heard about it? And Moses, wish that you took us back to Egypt and we all died there, then you take us out here and die in the wilderness. Listen to those belly acres. How about today? Do we have belly acres in the church? Please be quiet because if you want to have a hard time, belly ache, because then you'll go through some wilderness. You sent yourself there. Don't blame it on God. Don't blame it on the devil because he didn't even do it. You take your eyes off of Jesus and put them on you long enough and you'll have a wilderness. Are you with me? Then it goes on verse 10. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they will always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. Folks, whose ways are we supposed to be studying? Do you know his ways? Do you know how Jesus would handle your life? Are you letting him take charge? Or are you in command? 
They didn't know his ways, but you and I get a chance to, can you say amen? Then it goes on. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. We have rest. Everyone say, I have a rest from God. I didn't earn it, but I dwell in it. We dwell in Christ, and he's already at rest. He's not fighting any battles, only the battles you release him to fight. He's already won. And finally, Hebrews chapter 4, 1 and 3 says, Therefore, since a promise of remains of entering into his rest, let us, let us fear, lest any of us should come short of it. We need that rest. Can you say amen? For indeed, the gospel was preached unto us as well as unto them. But the word which they heard didn't profit them because they didn't mix it with their faith. Hello. It's kind of like going to church and hearing some good words and going, enjoying the good food and not applying anything. Guess what? You're like this person right here. Nothing's going to go for you because you're living for God in your head. And every time you get offended and every time you get that, it's all in your head and by your emotions. You can't live that way. You have to die. Everyone say, die is a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. Because if you're dead, you don't take offense. Somebody could come and say, I've got, I want to bash your mom and I want to beat you up. You look up and smile and says, good luck because God's going to beat the tar out of you. <laughs> and you're not taking offense because you have the upper life. You have the highway and not the low way. You have the first and not the last. You got the beginning and not the end. And God says, I'll see you through. We're going to the other side. If you've got somebody this morning, would you give the Lord a hand clap?